when I talk about love more, hate less, I promise you that there is a connection that is inside all of us, right? And there's something that's very deep inside of us that believe in loving more. They are speakers, authors, and real life rock stars, bringing you life-changing thoughts that rock, taking conversation all the way to 11. Most shows only go to 10. Well, it's one louder, isn't it? These go to 11. To 11. This is Thoughts That Rock. Now, here are your hosts, Jim Knight and Brant Menzoir. What's up? What's, what's up, up, people? What's happening? It's Thoughts That Rock. It's your favorite podcast, all 12 mm -hmm. of you. Welcome back. We are super excited, uh, you know, to, to welcome you to the the How To Podcast, where we try to find challenges that people are facing today, come up with some incredible guests to give you some advice as to maybe how to deal with those challenges. And today is, uh, is we're, we're taking you to church today. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> It's the biggest challenge. The truth. You know, you start talking about what kind of topic, what how to topic can we solve? And and our guest said, uh, "I want to solve the world. That's Let's right. change the world. How to change oh, the world? Okay, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if we had the if we had the money, we'd have. Uh, 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 <laughs> I, I could yeah, change. Solve, I could change the world. Right? Change the world. That's uh, yeah. what's his name, <laughs> Eric. Eric, what's uh, 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 I could change the world. I don't know. No, what's his name? Eric <laughs> Clapton. Dang. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. It's bad. It's bad. Getting old sucks. I was going to talk about getting old sucks. Our children. That's right. <laughs> children are our future brain. That's, That's right. all I can say. That's right. Let's so, really, on. we're not kidding around. The topic is uh, how to change the world. And, uh, and, and our friend Desmond Mead, I say our friend, I want to be his friend because this guy, pretty influential. Yeah. You know, I, um, I met this guy on an airplane coming back. Some people probably know him right off the, the bat as soon as I say his name, but I didn't really know him. But I knew his story only because he was in the news and you and I are, you know, from Central Florida. And it was a big deal when when what he was working on as an activist actually came to fruition. Yeah. Real quick, you know, Desmond was a um, you know homeless. He was a drug addict. Decided to sort of lift himself out of all of that and went to law school. Got a degree. Became an activist. And Time Magazine listed him just a few years ago, 2019, as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And it's really because. He changed and, and made it happen through the courts. He changed uh, the ability for convicted felons, felons to vote. I mean, he changed the voting rights and, and had that pass here in the state of Florida. I guess 1.5 or 1.6 million people now have, you know, at least that part of their civil rights restored. Yep. And so, boy, he gets a lot of credit. Um a lot of kudos, you know, certainly all of a sudden when you're reading through his bio and I highly encourage you, this is one of those times you got to go look in the show notes totally. of this guy's bio because he's got so many awards and, and winning Floridian and Central Floridian person of the year in 2019. I, I you know, this won't be in the show notes because it wasn't even mentioned there before, but his organization has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. So, Whew. you know, by the time this airs, he may actually be a Nobel Peace Prize winner. That might be a first for us, I think, on the show, right? That's right. Take that. Take that. With people thinking we don't have the best the best on this show. Yes, we do. We have Nobel Who Prize. Think no, that? I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to create controversy. It seems to be the only thing that sells these days. <laughs> we, need, we need at least 13, 14 people on this show. That's that would be awesome. right. That's right. You guys now Desmond, Desmond was fantastic. And really for all the work that he does, his book, um, you know, he's an author I mentioned yep. uh, is called let my people vote. And it is that story about restoring civil rights to people who unfortunately um, are, you know, have been incarcerated and they're returning to society. He's got some great quotes in there. I think I saw Stacey Abrams did yeah. one of the uh, forward. So just an interesting guy for sure. And, uh, you know, uh, this is one of the times where you and I didn't have to say a lot. I mean, nope. he, I thought it was going to be a short episode and boom, he really did. He took us to a whole different level. That's very inspiring. We got like three of the 10 commandments. It's amazing. You, you guys are going to absolutely love this episode with Desmond Mead. Check it out. There he is. Desmond Mead. Welcome to the show, my friend. 
Yo, what's up? What's up? How y'all doing? <laughs> We're doing good. Feeling very uh, underaccomplished after that intro of all the, all the accolades, Desmond, that you have. I'm feeling like I wasted the first third of my life. So, so uh, congratulations on. Right. I'm telling you what. Yeah. I'm telling you what. I thought I, I thought I was carrying my weight until I met Desmond, and now I'm like, oh dang. <laughs> I got some work to do. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you know, he, he's one of the most influential people in the world. I just, I'm happy that I got listed in the local newspaper once. And that was it. <laughs> winter Park's most famous. Yeah. Win, right. yeah. Winter, 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 winter Garden. Garden. Yeah, winter Garden. Winter Park famous. would have been better. That's right. Well, Desmond, you know, you That's know, right. the jam, man. Thank you so much again for just being on the show. And, uh, you know, I was telling Brant, obviously in the introduction, how we met on the airplane and, you know, I, I had remembered the whole story about everything that you had been working on, but to actually then read it in your book and talk to you about it was really just a real joy for me. And we're just lucky to have you on. Our audience is going to get a lot out of this. So we're going to leave it open to you, man. The topic, as we said, is uh, how to change the world. So that is, that is bold, man. I love it. I love it. So what, what is your... Uh, what, what is that first thought that rocks? Or what do you want to do to maybe start off before you lay on some of this wisdom with us? Well, let, let me tell you, I am, I'm looking to make sure that, that Brent will have a brighter outlook after he hear these, these thoughts that rock about, <laughs> not a, I, I guess you can interchange it with, with, with change and save, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, when you say change, sometimes it can be changed for the worse, right? But no, yeah. we want to save the world, right? And so the first thought right off the top of my head is, you know, just thinking about that adage that, you know, we've heard so many times, right? And, and I see the chain around your neck, but you don't have a link chain like mine. Mm -hmm. But you've heard the adage that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me walk. I want to walk this out. Right. Because when you have all these links on the chain. Right. And you put weight on it. Right. It will. That chain will pop. Right. Where they can find the weakest link. And so it doesn't matter. For instance, how much stronger you make the other links of the chain, right? If if the weakest link could only hold 10 pounds, then I don't care if the other links could hold a thousand pounds, that chain mm. is only going to hold 10 pounds, right? And so the first mm -hmm. thing is, is that if we want to save and change the world, then we must apply that adage to us, or to our society, to the world. Our world, our communities, our state, our country could only be as strong as the people in it that has been most weakened by various systems, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so if we want a stronger world, if we want a better world, then we have got to focus on how we can empower, how we can strengthen the weakest link, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we're not going anywhere. We're only going as far as the weakest link could take us. Right. That's about it. That we, we yeah. only going as far as that. And so, so many times we get caught up in, you know, I, I want to be stronger. I want to make more money. I want to have the titles and all this. You no, know, I want to you know climb this uh, economic ladder of success or whatever, you know, and we get so caught up in ourselves. Right. That we forget about others. And then at some point we realize that no matter how much money and fame we have, man, we could only really go so far. You know, yeah. I could be the richest guy in the community, but if everybody in my community is is formerly incarcerated and can't get a job or addicted to drugs and alcohol, right? And man, listen, they were breaking in my house, trying to you know take all of the things I worked hard for, right? Yeah. And it's gonna yeah. be one thing after another, you know? Folks look at, you know, for instance, in our society, we see how much we spend on incarcerating people and policing people, right? Mm -hmm. 10, 20 times more than we spend on educating our kids or caring for our mm -hmm. elderly, right? Mm -hmm. And so that happens when you get so caught up, you know, in just building up your personal strength and not giving thought, right, to the people who is most weakest in our communities. And we all, oh, they'll make it. I made it on my own. They'll make it. And if they don't make it, it's because they don't want to make it or, you know, some other issues. Right. But at the end of the day, mm. we have to realize that we're all part of the human link. Right. We're all human links in this chain, this great chain. And if we do want to carry more weight, if we want to 
and, and improve our society, then we've got to strengthen the weakest link. Love it. I love that. Yeah. It's, you know, I think it's interesting that, um, I think a lot of us think that if we can carry, uh, more than our weight that we're actually doing a service, right? We're, we're helping others. But in, in fact, um, it doesn't matter in, in what you're saying is it doesn't really matter if you can carry 10 times the weight uh, of the person next to you. If the weakest link is the weakest link, that's where the chain's going to break. That's where it's going to And so, yeah, how, how, how do you go about helping to, to strengthen the weakest link? Um, I guess, I guess I'm curious because I, I think it's easier for us to turn towards personal development and try to, you know, try to improve ourselves. How do we do that in such a way that it, it isn't offensive? It doesn't assume anything like what, what's the best way to approach helping to strengthen the weakest link? I mean, so I, I could, I could speak in general, you know, I mean, if someone is having a, say a mental health issue, right. Mm -hmm. and, and this is mm -hmm. something that the United States should be ashamed of that we've turned mental health hospitals into prisons. Right. And that's where mm -hmm. we actually treat our people with mental health conditions. We you know we don't invest in, in mental health facilities to address that. And so you may find a lot of folks that are homeless that have, or, or you know, are dealing with mental health issues. But what you'll see, like for instance, in the city of Tallahassee, they're, they're arresting vagrants, right. And throwing mm -hmm. them in jail. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, mm -hmm. these people, right. Have mental health issues. Right. Uh, sometimes like I've experienced homeless for like over 10 years and in homelessness, what I find is that, man, listen, over half the population is one paycheck away from being homeless. Right. Yeah. And, be, and, and, yeah. and we criminalize homelessness. But, you know, the thing about it, if we want to strengthen it, then we find a way. How do we increase opportunities for people to be more financially secure? Right. You know, their family being able to be provided for. You know, we, we have many cities and where people can't even afford to to rent, right, in the communities that they live in more. And then they have to travel. They don't have transportation. All of these things mixed up together, you know, I think is, is what we approach with. Now, let me get more specific because a lot of times with the work that I do, I deal with people who have made mistakes in their life, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And so this is, this is plain simple, right? Three things. Number one, that when a person gets a felony conviction, right? They, they, they in, instantaneously are saddled with a, a ton of collateral consequences, right? Uh, um, mm -hmm. So a person, they commit a crime, they get caught, they get punished. They, now the judge says, you're gonna, this is your punishment. After they serve their punishment, that's when their true sentence begin because they can't get a job, they can't get housing, they can't get an education, right? They, they, they can't yeah. vote. And when you have all of these different barriers, right, that's creating obstacles, right, those obstacles actually prevent successful reentry, right, or, or successful reintegration back into the community, right? And so when mm -hmm. I talk about, you know, empowering the weakest link, you know, in my opinion, those are people who've been caught up in the criminal justice system. How do we address it? I, I like your question, Brent. Here's the whole deal. If you can remove, if I can't get a job or if I can't get housing or if I can't get edu a, a good education, what do you think is more li most likely that I'm going to do? I'm going to commit another crime, right? Yeah. And yeah. guess yeah. what? When I commit another crime, you got to investigate it. Then you got to catch me. Then you, when you catch me, you got to take me to trial. And after you, you, you if you find me guilty, then you send me to prison. All that are resources that could have been going elsewhere right and what was the, how do you address it well when i get out don't hold it against me to prevent me from getting a job you would you know listen you want me to pull myself up by my bootstraps you want me to not commit an offense but every time i turn around you're holding my past against me i can't i can't get the job i go to listen me Nobel Peace Prize nominee, genius, all of this. Oh, the, oh, I didn't tell you that. I just nominated for Nobel Peace Prize. My yeah, place, yeah. Right? But here's the whole deal, right? Even me, with all of the accomplishments that I made, 
would catch hell trying to rent or even own a home because if it's not the owner, it could be the insurance, the homeowner's insurance, right? It could be the mortgage a company that runs background checks and either one of them, when they see, oh, he's been convicted of a felony in the past. Oh, we can't rent to you. Oh, we can't move forward yep. with this mortgage, right? This is something yep. I experienced. And these are unnecessary obstacles that we place on people. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so there's simple ways we address that, you know? And that, so we're talking about access to economic mobility. That means give me access to jobs. Give me access to being able to own or even rent a home, right? Give me access to education, mm -hmm. right? Maybe if mm -hmm. I can get a degree, I could improve my life and I could get a better job. Mm -hmm. And guess what? When I get a better job, everybody benefits because guess what? I get to pay my fair share of taxes, yeah. right? I, I get to do it. If yeah. I'm Listen, if I'm able to buy a house, I've heard this. Now, you guys can dispute this if you want, but I heard that when you buy a house, you create about seven, eight jobs. So I stimulate, mm -hmm. I can help stimulate the economy if I'm able to buy a home. But if you stop me from that, you don't benefit. And eventually you end up suffering from me going back and committing another offense. And then I end up suffering. My family end up suffering. And our community yeah. just goes down even further. Right. And then of course, democracy. You know, uh, being blocked, you no, know, being blocked access to democracy. You know, if if I don't vote, and studies have showed this, right? When you restore someone's civil rights you reduce the likelihood of them committing another crime by over 22 percentage points. Wow. Right. This wow. is over 22 percentage points. This is facts, right? Based on studies by the Florida Office of Offender Review and Parole Commission, right? Where you see the normal person with a 33 percent chance of, of, of recidivating or committing another offense. But when they have their civil rights restored, that's reduced to 11.4 percent. Right. Everybody benefits from this. And there's some simple things that you can do to strengthen folks. I become a stronger individual. I become a bigger asset to society when I'm able to get a job, when I'm able to provide for me and my family, when I'm able to have safe and affordable housing, when I'm able to engage in activities that increases my self-esteem and don't, you know, like just drag me through the mud over something I did 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so that's where I'm yep. at with that. Brad. Yeah. Love it. You know, it's your activism, your, the work that you do, the people that you really have supported and empowered is definitely different than where my mind initially goes when I hear that phrase, because I, you know, my background was all in business and it's funny because you know, the, the work that the Gallup organization has done or Marcus Buckingham, these guys that write the books that talk about just focus on people's strengths, not their weaknesses. When I hear the, you know, a chain is only as good as its weakest link, you know what business says. They're like, you got to upgrade. You got to get rid of that weakest link. You got to make sure you've always got the, this upper echelon so that you can perform. And that almost is, is flying contrary because you want to fix people. You want to make them better for sure. So in business, I don't know how you feel about that. It maybe is no, a little bit different. No, no, it's not different. It's, it's the not, same. Because yeah. guess what? When you get rid of one weakest link, then you're going to have another weakest link. Mm. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, point. Yeah, that's true. That, that, that is just not change, right? Yeah. Say, okay, let's get rid of all of the, the one pounders or whatever uh, links that can only hold one pound and let I'm holding 10 pounds, so let's get everything 10 pounds, right? But guess what? There's going to be links that can hold 20 pounds. Yeah. You become, yeah. Now you become the weakest link. You know, it reminds me of, you know, back in school, you know how sometimes kids can be so cruel and they would make fun <laughs> of someone because they may not wear the, the right shoes or the right designer clothes. You've seen that, right? Yeah, yeah, Brant does that with yeah. me. Brant, yeah, you had that happen to you before, Brant. You look like you were, <laughs> yeah. You look like you were stylish. Were you stylish, or did they pick at you in school? Right? Yeah. No, no one was stylish in the eighties, bro. Oh yeah, no uh, one was. You know, stylish you had the Sasson, and you know, uh, excuse me, are you wearing my Jordache? Are those bugle boy jeans you're wearing and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that? You know, everybody wanted those. Yeah, you know? but the the thing was, what I noticed was the very same people who picked, say, on me 
because mm -hmm. I may not have been as fashionable as them, right? Or I didn't have as much money as them would turn around and say, that guy should not treat me like crap just because he's rich. Cause I'm just as, I'm just as good as he is. I'm just mm -hmm. as valuable as he is. Well, wait a minute. If that is the mm -hmm. case, then why are you looking down on me? Right? right. Cause if you're saying right. it's okay to look down on me, then that means it's okay for somebody to look down on you and treat yeah. you like crap. Yeah, that's right. Right. Which is going to go right. to one of the second thing or the third thing. But here's the whole thing, Jim, as even from the business community, if you're saying, okay, get rid of the weakest link, what happens when you become the weakest link? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what happens then? Right. Yeah. And, 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 but the other piece I know in business is that you, you, you got to know where your gaps are and you strengthen your gaps, you know, you, you, you strengthen mm -hmm. your gaps. And, yeah. and, and sometimes what happens is when you strengthen your gap, that becomes the most effective money-making uh, 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 um, a, a sector in your business. You know, mm -hmm. you can take a weakness and turn it into a strength, you know, and, and I think that that's how we become more successful. That's how we become more prosperous. As a matter of fact, Jim, that's how you save the world. Strengthen your weakness. Yeah. Do we even need the other two is what you're saying. I see. Yeah. It's <laughs> strengthen the other links. Yeah, but, but see, they're all, they're all going to be interrelated, right? So that's yeah. just part of it, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. but so listen, number two. Right. Yeah. You, you talk about strengthening, right, the weakest link, right? But what is that motivation for doing that? Right. And what I'm saying for number two, the thought that rock, if you want to say the world, love more, hate less. Yeah. Love more, hate less. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you, mm -hmm. when you hear the word love, man, everybody's like, Oh yeah, I know that. I promise you, a lot of folks is not truly understanding what this word love really means, right? I'm not talking about like, I'm talking about love, right? You know, one of the definitions that I use, and, and it's kind of weird definition, but I just use it because it, it, it feels good, you know, when it, when it comes out of my mouth, is that a good definition of love for me is wanting for your neighbor what you want for yourself, mm. right? Yeah. Um, it's almost like a good guiding post for me. But I want to let me get a little deeper with this. When I talk about love more, hate less, I promise you that there is a connection that is inside all of us, right? And there's something that's buried deep inside of us that believe in loving more and believing that believes in connecting with each other along the lines of humanity, that care about each other as if, you know, or, or wanting for somebody what we would want for ourselves. When I say love, you know, I tell folks that I'm not talking about the easy love, right? Mm -hmm. The easy love, it, it's so easy to say you love somebody who confer a benefit to you. It's so easy to say you love somebody that make you feel good. You know what I'm saying? Listen, Brent gives you a million dollars right now, Jim, I'm pretty sure you won't have any problem whatsoever to say, I love you, bro. You know, you won't have any problem saying that because he conferred a benefit and made you feel good. Yeah. That's not the love that I learned about in the Bible. That's yeah. not the love mm -hmm. that I end up going through a process during my time from being homeless and addicted to drugs to where I'm at now. I learned, I learned about that love that's in the Bible and it's a beautiful love. It's a powerful love. It's a love so powerful it can change and save the world. It's about being able to love someone who hates you being yeah. able to love someone who who may be even a threat to you, right? That's that kind of love. How do you love your enemies, right? And how do you want for your enemies what you want for yourself, right? Let me tell you, when I was in, in, in treatment, I remember, and I write about it in my book, how when I know what I was going to wear the next day, I would, you know, at night I would take, you know, uh, put the outfit together and I get the shoes that I'm going to wear with the outfit and I throw it underneath the bed. So in the morning when I wake up and I get dressed, right, got to get them shoes and they all the way underneath the bed. So it means I got to get down on my knees to reach under the bed to get the shoes. And, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, well, since I'm already down here on my knees, I might well have a conversation with my higher power, right? 
And one mm-hmm. of the first things that came out of my mouth every single morning when I'm waking up and even at night when I'm going to bed is that the first group of people I pay for, pray for are the people who I perceive to be mm-hmm. my enemy, people who I think are hating me or hating on me or trying to do, uh, do some harm to me. They're the very first people mm-hmm. who I pray for. And you know what I pray? Not that God would rain fire destruction against on them or not that bad things would happen to them. No, I actually prayed that they would get to experience the love that I'm experiencing through my relationship with my high power. Right. Mm. And I started to think that maybe sometimes some folks are really mean and nasty because deep down inside they're hurting and they're void of love. Right. And responding to their hurt and nastiness with nastiness does not help the situation only exasperates the problem right but if we could find some type of way to let them experience that love and joy that we have maybe they won't be as bitter right and i prayed for Mm -hmm. them to experience that love i prayed for my family's safety and health and then the last thing i prayed for was for god to give me the, the the wisdom strength stamina discernment to just do his work and his work was very simple to me it was just to to find ways to improve the lives of other people, not my life, but to improve the lives of other people. The things I may want for myself, I fight so that other people can have, right? And what I learned hmm. is that, you know, MLK talks about it. You know, hate can't drive out hate, fear can't drive out fear, right? But man, the one thing that, or darkness can't drive out darkness, but the one thing that can conquer all of that stuff, L O V E. Mm-hmm. Right. The real L.O.B.E., the, the kind that would say that even though you and I may disagree on politics, even though you and I may have different religious views, even though you and I may be different nationalities or, or different ethnicities, even though that there are these things that 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 distinguishes us from each other, separates us from each other. Right. Even in spite of all of that. I see your humanity and I love you and Jim Brandt, all your listeners, viewers. I love each and every one of you and I want the best for you. And I don't need, man, listen, I was on my knees in this treatment center praying for you guys and never even met you before. And you're like, that that sounds weird as hell. How are you going to pray for someone who you don't even know? Well, no, what I am connected with and what I do know is that your humanity and even as a person of faith, I know that you're a child of God. Well, you're a child of God. If, yeah. if I'm just a person of faith, I know that much, right? And if you're a child of God, that makes you my brother. Yeah. In spite of our differences, we've got a common connection, right? And so I see the humanity in folks before I even have to meet them. And so I want a better world for you, right? I, I want a safer world for you and for your kids and your grandkids. And so that's what I just dive into. And I found that in diving into it, you know, and being really committed to that, man, life is prosperous. Prosperous. Let me tell you quick, two, two quick stories, right? Here's story number one. You know, a, a friend of mine, his son was murdered in Tallahassee and he had a Jewish funeral. The rabbi at the funeral was talking about the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, right? The two major bodies of water in the Middle East, right? And talk mm-hmm. about how these two uh, uh, bodies of water were so drastically different. One was vibrant and full of life while the other one was void and full of life, dead. And he said that both of these bodies got their nutrients or received their nutrients from the same source. They got their blessings from the same source. And the question he asked was, how could it be that these bodies of water that receive their nutrients and blessings from the same source be so drastically different? One vibrant and full of life and the other one dead and void of it. And the answer was so simple. You see, the Sea of Galilee had tributaries. And so whatever blessings it received, it, what, you know what it did? It passed on to other bodies of water. It was like a filtration system, right? Yeah. While the Dead Sea is self-enclosed. So everything it received, it held on to. It held on to. Back to that first point, just give me, give me, give me. Let me get stronger. Let me get stronger. Yeah, but guess what? When What happens is because you're holding on to everything, 
because the only concern you have is how strong you can get, you end up becoming oversaturated and you end up killing yourself from within. And so there are times when you, people look like they have a lot of stuff, but on the inside, they're dead. They're void of joy or love. And they're, they, I mean, they're a, a chore to be around, yeah. right? When, but then you can find someone on the other hand that may not appear to have everything. But guess what? Guess what happens? You love hanging around those folks. You love, you know what I'm saying, just being around them because they just enjoy it. Because even if they get a little, they give it back. They share yeah. it with us, mm. right? That's story number one, right? And that's that love, that's part of that love piece. How can I pour out into you? How can I do something, whatever blessings I have, and pass it on to you, your viewers, in some kind of way? And then when I do that, right, my intention is to make sure you're having a better life and living in a better and safer world. And guess what? Then my life improves, right? And I think that that was part of the basis of why we got nominated for Nobel Peace Prize. The other part is part of the reason too, and here's the other story. I mean, Jim, you riding down, you know, right? we know how traffic is sometimes in Florida, right? Mm -hmm. You're on I-4, you know, or you're on the turnpike, you're driving somewhere and there's an accident ahead and there's someone laying on the ground. Jim, you decide to stop. You stop your car, you get out, you run up to that person. I promise you, Jim, I promise you, I bet you a steak dinner. Your first question is not going to be, did you vote for Donald Trump or did you vote for <laughs> Joe Biden? Right? When you when you run up on that person, it's not going to be, I promise you, uh, two steak dinners is not going to be what's your sexual identity. Yeah. It's not yeah. going to be what's your immigration status. It's not going to be how right. much money you make. It's not going to be what's your religious preference. I promise you. The first question is going to be somewhere along the lines of, are you okay? How can I help? Yeah. Right? Yeah. In those moments of calamity, hurricanes come through Florida, and man, when it destroys communities, man, we come together and we don't give a damn about the person's politics or none of that. What we instantly connect with is each other's humanity. It's in those moments that our country is great. It's in those moments that we operate in our greatness as human beings. It's in those moments that we connect with each other along the lines of love, right? Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something, right? Because folks, man, they love. there's a lot of folks that peddle hate and fear, right? And they use it to drive their own personal agendas. And, and, and while they may be profiting, our country and community is getting torn apart, right? Let me tell you something about this connectivity that we have that is already inherently inside of us. This is not me being Don Quixote trying to fight a windmill. This is some real stuff that we have inside of us. Surfside, when that collapsed, right? 9-11, when the building collapsed, no one gave two cents about anybody's politics. But you know, let me tell you what happens. We are so connected in such a profound way that transcends everything that folks say should divide us, that we are even willing to put our own lives in danger to save yours, to save somebody else, a stranger that we don't even know. We don't, I don't even know your politics and I put my life on the line. You've seen that at Surfside. People were digging through that rubble as if it was their mother that was in there. Yeah. Right, you've seen that in 9-11 where firefighters were and other folks was running up in that building as if it was their own relative in there and they knew that they could possibly die and lose their lives, but we were running a burning house to save a child and we don't even know if their parents are Democrat or Republican, if they're gay, lesbian, transsexual, bisexual, whatever other kind of term they, we, None of that matters when we connect with each other along the lines of humanity. And let love be that drive. If we can operate, why do we wait for natural disasters to love our neighbor as if we love our, want for our neighbor what we want for ourselves? Because when we go to help, we, somewhere in the back of my mind is like, man, because if I got to help this person, because if ever I'm in this situation, man, I would definitely would love to have somebody help me like this. Yeah. Wanting for your neighbor what you want for yourself. If I'm hurt, I don't want nobody 
wanting to know who I voted for. I want somebody to come around that can help me, that can heal me, that can get me to the hospital. Yeah. And we do this. So why do we wait for natural disasters? I submit to you gentlemen that we don't have to wait for a natural disaster to see the humanity in each other. We don't have to wait for a calamity to want for somebody what we want for ourselves. We don't have to wait for destruction to love. And if we love, guess what? It avoids a lot of social destructions that we're engaging in, right? That we're facing right now. Yeah, no doubt. Mm. Man, you you are you're speaking our language. I mean, it's um, you know, both of us are faith-based guys. Brand actually pastored a church uh for a few years as well. And again, my background as Desmond, I know you're in front of people all the time and, and Brant and I both do uh, a lot of different presentations as keynote speakers. I do use the word love every once in a while. And I definitely did not go into as much details. You just did. I just felt like I was in church. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, but, but, but I will say we need a little bit more love in the world. And I have no problem saying those exact words, even in a complete, total business conference mastermind, whatever it is, for the exact reasons that you're talking about. I just know that the world in general, and, and maybe you start with this country, our community, wherever as small or big as it is, if you just started with using that mentality, we're going to be in a much different place. And, and both of us have used, you know, the old platinum rule. We talked about the golden rule a lot, which you hear in scripture. But it isn't necessarily just treating people the way that you want to be treated, right? It's it's treating people the way that they want to be treated. And and it's the same mentality that you were just talking about. So, man, I, I think that is that is powerful. And I can see exactly why you're able to impact and influence as many people as you do is just taking something so, so small and so easy, but it's so profound, right? I, I love it. I, I think that's a, that's a great way of looking at at. Uh, changing whatever the world is for for you and your specific sphere that's great yeah yeah thank you so much yeah man so what is what is your bring us home now i i already feel like i'm in a good headspace what is your third and final thought that rocks on this how do you change or even save the world well the third and final thought is to buy my book <laughs> 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 if you read the book, you get the blueprint, right? <laughs> should, I just put it, should I just put it up for everybody? I love see? it. Yeah, just put it I out love it, like, man. You know, all, all, all major platforms, uh, specifically Amazon. But no, um, let me tell you. I was not expecting that. We should just end the episode right there. Boom, that that's is, it. Got that's it. the. That's it. That's the sound bite. Well, here's the thing, right? I'm going to loop this thing right back. Right, I'm gonna loop this thing right back. You know, yeah, um, I've often heard this adage that those who are closest to the pain often the one who is closest to the solution. Mm. Right, mm. Um, and let me tell you, right, because so many times we talk about, you know, let me. So we know about medical malpractice, right? So medical malpractice, I, I'm gonna give a great example, right? So you're hurting, something is going on inside of you, you don't know what it is, but you gotta go to the doctor. You make it a doctor's appointment, you get to the doctor's office, right? As soon as you walk in the doctor's office, right? The doctor starts handing you medication, say, I'll take two of these, take three of these, right? Let me tell you, this doctor has every degree they need to have on his wall. Right. All the major medical schools he's been to, he's like in Time magazine, 100 top doctors in the world. But if you walk into his office and he starts handing you medication, uh, you're going to have a problem with that because he haven't even asked you what was wrong. How in the <laughs> heck is he going to prescribe you something when he has not even had a conversation with you? Right. And so you're going to be kind of hesitant to be just taking some weird drugs and you didn't even have a conversation with it. malpractice. I think sometimes we do it socially. So there's social malpractice. And that means that we're talking about the ills of our communities, the ills, all of the things that are wrong. Right. But we're not trying to, because we're so smart and we have all the degrees. Oh, we're, we're, we have, we know these solutions. We know the solution. We got to, 
do this, 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 and this. But we come up with these solutions without having a conversation with the people who are most closest to the pain. Mm. So mm-hmm. my third thought that rocks, right, is that if we allow people who are closest to the pain to be a part of the solution, we actually can tap into, you ready for this? You ready for this? Our own SEAL Team 6. Hmm. You're like, Devin, what are you talking about? Let me tell you. A lot of times when I talk to recovering addicts and I talk to, you know, people who've been caught up in the justice system, you know, because it's so easy for us to walk. Because I remember I did it when I was homeless, hooked on drugs. Shoot, yeah, I'm walking around with my head down. I mean, I'm a nobody. That's what led me to stand in front of railroad tracks waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. I didn't have any self-esteem. I didn't have any hope. I didn't see any proverbial light at the end of the tunnel and I was ready to end my life, right? Because I was a disappointment and shame to everyone, right? What I didn't realize, right, is here's a couple things, right? Number one, as a person of faith, one thing I've always seen is that God always uses the least among a group of people to bring about the biggest change, right? Mm -hmm. I can go to like this this guy, this boy named David, right? Couldn't even qualify to to get in the army, but then God used him to defeat an enemy that even the army was scared of, right? Mm -hmm. And then I can go further down the line and I could talk about this guy, his name was Saul, right? Mm -hmm. And if Saul was alive today, we would all be screaming that he, be buried underneath the deal. We know he needs the electric chair. We'll be screaming for that, but that's who God chose. And now he's a reverend leader from the uh, from the New Testament, right? Who now is Paul, right? Apostle Paul. But before he was Paul, he was Saul, and he was doing some very devious things, so bad that when God sent him to Ananias, uh, and I was like, God, you sure you got the right man? <laughs> this dude been killing us, you know? You sure you got the right person? But I got, yeah, I got the right person. That he gets, God gets, no, like even in prison, right? I don't get any props for beating up on somebody smaller than me. Mm-hmm. I get props if I beat up on somebody bigger than me, right? Somebody with a rep, right? And I feel like God don't get props by getting the strongest person to accomplish the things he need accomplished. He, don't, mm-hmm. he, don't get he gets props by getting the weakest people to, to accomplish the great things, right? And when I turn this into those things into a modern day story, I talk about when uh, Osama bin Laden, when, when he was killed, right? President Obama mm-hmm. sent, <clears throat> they found out where he was and what they did was that they didn't get like the recruits from training, basic training, right? They got hardened, seasoned veterans, the best of the best. They got somebody that went through hell. They got somebody that's been shot at, that's been shot, that's been hurt, that have extensive combat experience, not minimal or no combat experience. They went and got people that's been through some stuff. That's who he got, right? Someone that wouldn't flinch right in, in 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 the time of crisis that's what he got yeah and seal team six the best of the best went over there and got the job done and so i tell recovering addicts i tell people who've been impacted by the justice system man you like te- you could be team seal team six you've been through hell you you've seen the worst of the worst and drug addiction could take you some places that oh my god and you were able to come out of it Alive? Man, obviously, God has allowed you to go through these things to prepare you to be of service to him in a major way. Because that's what I see all through the Bible, right? He takes us through some things to get us right. And so your drug addiction, your 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 incarceration, your your trials and tribulations because of all the collateral consequences, society forcing you to wear this scarlet letter of shame and all these different challenges, right? You can either let it beat you down or you can take it and use it, right? In such a way that it will show the whole world how great God is because he took somebody 
whose society once despised and turn them into a Nobel Peace Prize. I like that. I just came up with that. <laughs> Thank you, somebody who society once despised and turn them into a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, right? That's how God gets his props, right? He gets his props that way. And so what I'm telling folks is that when you want the tough things done and you want to tackle the tough problems that our society is facing, then you get people who are part of the problem and convert them into being part of the solution. And you're going to get the right solutions to those problems. And it's going to be done in a profound and powerful way. Yeah. You don't have to engage in social malpractice. You could just mm. get, um, take, take, the, take, a, take a page out of the playbook for God. Yeah. And you get the people that's been through their pain. And man, you capture them and you empower them. You empower them. Right. You're talking about the weakest link. Right. We empower them and we approach them with love. Let me tell you something. I'm going to leave. I'm, 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 I'm going to close with this. Right. Because I know I can tell by by Brant's shoulders that it's a possibility. Good possibility. He might be a sports fan. <laughs> right. Possibility. Right. The glasses is okay. putting him off. Right. Because most jocks are not going to wear glasses. <laughs> Right, unless they're Tom Brady, and maybe he's going for the Tom Brady look. I don't know, or the Howie Long look. But here's the deal: you got to remember Michael Vick, that. right? <clears throat> Michael yep. Vick went to jail, yeah, for fighting dogs. Yep, fighting that. Yep. And you know, I don't know if you guys ever seen a dog fight or a cock fight, but those are like some very violent, vicious spectacles. Right. Yeah. I mean, those mm -hmm. dog fights, those dogs go at each other and they fight to death. And there's blood and yep. gore everywhere. There's just violent, <clears throat> profound violence there, right? And 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 and, and, and after describing what like even with cockfights, how they put the blades on the ends of talons and those those roosters go after each other and they fight to the death. You know what I asked folks after that, Brett? I asked them how many people got mad at the dogs. Yeah. Many people got mad at those vicious animals, those murderous animals that was engaged in all that violence. Nobody, you know who they got mad at? They got mad at the person that created the conditions, right? Right? Yeah. The person yeah. that trained these animals. That's who they got mad at. You know what their response was to the vicious, violent animals? <laughs> Find them loving homes. Could you yeah. imagine that radical thought? To respond to violent creatures or creatures who we may seem to be violent with love instead yep. of anger and hatred. Yeah. How do we yep. find them loving homes? Right? That's what that yep. response was. Right? Yeah. And we'll do that to dogs, but we won't do that to human beings. How do we yep. do that? Right? And we would with the exception. Let me tell you when we'll do it. When it's our own son. When it's mm -hmm. our own daughter. Right, a family yep. member, right? Yep. And so to wrap all of this up is that we understand that if we want to be a better world, if we want to have a better world, right, for ourselves and our grandchildren, then the people who we hate the most has got to be the people who we love the most moving forward. Mm -hmm. And when we love them the most, then we're going to be committed to strengthening them and allowing them to be part of the solution of the problems that we face. That now creates this continuous cycle, right? Of healing and prosperity. That's how you say the world, instead of destruction and division. Where's my microphone? Well, I, I wish I could else. do a microphone. I'm telling you, <laughs> you know, um, we're going to we're going to close it here and I'm going to upload this immediately to Sermon Central. <laughs> yeah. Right. We're going to we're, we're going to let we're going to let this out there because that's that's you, you just took us to church for the last 45 minutes <laughs> yeah. and uh, we we can't thank you enough. It's it's a it's a message that um is not only wanted here but is needed. Yeah. And um and, and just thank you so much for the work that you're doing. How how can people if they if they want to stay in touch with you, if they want to follow your progress, if they want to find out if you win the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. How how do how do you want us to direct these folks? Hey, listen, you know, I am on Instagram. I am on uh twitter or they call it x now um yeah. yep at desmond mead um 
Uh, we have a website, www.floridarrc.com. Floridarrc.com is uh, our organizational website. Uh, but yeah, folks can, can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or even on Facebook, that Desmond Me. You know, I'm the only one that got the handsome face on there, so uh, I should be easy <laughs> to find. And then, folks, no, no, really, if you want a, 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 at least a partial bl blueprint, you know, I think that was the third thought that rocked by my book. Get my book. Uh, it's listen. It's available in audio and it's in my voice as well. Yeah, it's awesome. right, so folks can awesome. go to Amazon and, and look, let my people vote. Uh, they can get the book, and you know, I mean, hit me up. Yeah. <laughs> I have my, oh, my website at um, www.desmondme.com. Desmondme.com. All right. My website there. All right. Folks can hit me up there too as well. Well, we will have all of this for sure in the show notes. So don't don't worry about it. it. Hopefully some people are listening or they're sitting down writing it down, but they can go back and look at it. And again, yeah, the book is fantastic if people want to grab a hold of that. Um, I did tell Brant um, that, that you were telling me on the plane said, man, I make the best barbecue in town. I've never taken you up on that, but that's a big statement. I'm like, at some point, he took us to church. Now he's got to take us to barbecue hey, at some that's point. It. That's right. You know, I'm telling you right now, I could toot my horn, man. I, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to get these people out of my home now, man, because I have people come from all over the world. Right? They stay. And they try me on my barbecue, and, man, we had the ribs and the chicken and the wings and the, and the ribeye, bone in and without the bone. Mm. Um Mm. And let me tell you, so they camping out now, bro. I can't get rid of them. They're like, <laughs> they're after, water. I, after eating my steaks, they could never go to Charlie's anymore. They, it, no. <laughs> they're, they're totally just. So if you want, if you love eating out, don't come and try my barbecue because yeah. I'm going to totally mess up your dining experience. That's all right. right. We'll pick. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, man, we can't thank you enough for spending some time. Uh, you know, again, I know that you're extremely busy. This took us a while to make it happen, but we are so honored you just spent a, a good 45, 50 minutes with us. I know people are going to get a lot out of it, man. Bro, you're the best. You, Jim, I love you, bro. I love your spirit. It got us talking of two strangers on the plane, you know, and, you know, it was just that connection, that spirit. And so, Man, just keep yeah. doing your thing. Keep inspiring other folks, motivating other folks. And you know what? I'm telling you, now I'm looking at you and Brant. I think keep hanging out with Brant, man, because he's making you look good, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it's Desmond more. Man. You know, it really is. <laughs> it's awesome, man. You, it's bro. awesome. All right, my friend. You go have a good right. rest of the day. We'll talk to you soon. You're the best. Take care, brother. Hey, rock stars, thanks so much for tuning in. Yeah, and listen, we know how busy you are, and grabbing those little nuggets of wisdom that can amp up your life are super hard to come by. So we hope this episode helped you enough for you to maybe subscribe and consider leaving us a rating and a review so that we can continue to grow the show. Thus That Rock is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network and also supports Cannonball Kids Cancer and their fight for finding and funding treatment options for kids who have run out of options. They're amazing. Their work is incredible. To learn more, please go to cannonballkidscancer.org. Finally, if you're interested in having Grant or Jim or both of us speak at your event, whether as a virtual webinar or an in in-person conference keynote or mastermind, contact us directly at thoughtsatrock.com. Until next time, rock, rock on. on.